Welcome to the Covenant Podcast. The Covenant Podcast exists to equip listeners with theological content from a 1689 Baptist perspective. We're on the Man of God Network brought to you by Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. And in this conversation, we have the privilege to discuss something that doesn't directly pertain to uh, 1689 content, but perhaps this is something that we hope our listeners would be interested in specifically um, as we can consider um, some authors that many Reformed Baptists uh, like to pick up, including men like Herman Bovink. Uh, so the title of our episode today is Neo-Calvinism with Gray Satanto. Uh, welcome to the show, our brother Gray. Thanks so much, Austin. It's good to be here. Yeah, and uh, the title of our show, Neo, or of this episode, Neo-Calvinism, comes from the title of your book, uh, that you have co-authored with Corey Brock. But before we begin to uh, discuss some of the, th the themes in this book, can you introduce yourself to our audience since you are a first-time guest? Sure, yeah. I am an assistant professor of systematic theology at Reformed Theological Seminary, the Washington, D.C. campus. Started here at RTS back in 2020, but um, we had to teach over Zoom when I was still in Jakarta, Indonesia, because of a immigration COVID-related delay for uh, visas and things like that. But yeah, I've enjoyed joining RTS. Before that, I was a church planner and pastor um, back in Jakarta. Before that, I did my doctoral degree in the University of Edinburgh on the theological epistemology of Herman Bovink with James Eglinton, and um, went to seminary before that, and you know all the all the usual stuff. Well, Dr. Satanto, again, we are so grateful to have you here with us on the Covenant Podcast today, and as. Austin has just pointed out, we're going to be talking about the subject of neo-Calvinism coming from your book, Neo-Calvinism, A Theological Introduction. Maybe to begin our conversation, would you be willing to define neo-Calvinism for our listeners? I know that some have likely heard of Calvinism, and, and to add the neo uh, prefix to Calvinism, it, it may throw some people off, and I know there's probably a lot that could be said about why uh, neo-Calvinism is differentiated from Calvinism. So maybe just to start our conversation, you can give our audience a foundation to build off of. Yeah, absolutely. So I think when most American evangelical listeners hear the word Calvinism, they think the five points of Calvinism tulip, right? Um, and so they would therefore be aware that reformed is usually a broader category than Calvinist. Reformed refers usually to the confessional theology of whether you have the 1647 Westminster Confession of Faith or the 1689 London Baptist Confession, which is what you guys are adhering to. Um, you have this broader confessional framework of theology all the way, you know, it's a very precise doctrinal statement all the way from doctrine of scripture to last things. Um, so usually people think about reform as broader and Calvinist as more narrow, something like a soteriological system. But for Kuiper and Bovink, interestingly enough, they argued that to be a Calvinist was a broader reality than to be reformed. For them, Calvinism does not refer just to soteriology, but refers to a whole world and life view. Um, they talk about a whole physiognomy, even a cosmology, um, which is that 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 you're you're trying to think about all of life in light of that reform confession. So to be reformed is to be confessional for them, but to be a Calvinist is to apply all of that theological uh, data that you have in the confession to all areas of life, including um, the political sciences, the arts, philosophy, and so on. So that's a very clear statement from Bovink in the future of Calvinism. So um, even in that sort of definition, you already see sort of the neo of it. It's a pursuit of holistic reform theology. It's a, it's a attempt to show the ongoing foundational role of Reformed theology for all of life. And Kuiper and Bovink argued that this is because of modernity and modernism, particularly the sort of worldview that you get in the Enlightenment, which which presents to us a holistic form of unbelief and a form of unbelief that says, if God doesn't exist, then every area of life needs to be rethought in light of that non-existence, in light of that unbelief. And so if we have a more holistic form of unbelief in the modern age, so do we now need to consider the holistic form of belief that we have in the Christian faith. They argue that back in the era of Christendom, we can presuppose and assume that Christianity plays a foundational role in public life, but rarely is that 
um, foundational role actually talked about explicitly and drawn out explicitly and justified explicitly. So we've got a lot of lines that we, we trace out in Boving's and Kuiper's corpus, and we try to show um, their, their endeavors in that in that book, and also to show, this is a theological introduction, that neo-Calvinism is not primarily just about worldview, but it is actually a theology. It's, it's about uh, a theological system that undergirds their attempts to show the relevance of Christianity for all of life. And we can talk more about that. Mm. Mm. That's very helpful. Uh, thank you for beginning to introduce our subject on neo-Calvinism. And in that answer, uh, you mentioned two men that we want to talk a little bit further about in this yeah. conversation, Abraham Kuyper and Herman Bovink. Uh, you mentioned you did some of your study on Herman Bovink in your doctoral uh, work with James Eglinton. We've had him on in the past to do an episode on his biography on Good. Bovink. Um, but for our listeners that haven't caught that conversation or perhaps are learning about Herman Bovink for the first time, although we would guess that the majority of our audience know who Herman Bovink is. Um, we'll ask you this question for this conversation related to your book, since you mention them very frequently. Who were Abraham Kuyper and who, uh, who was Herman Bovink and why are they important for this discussion? On yeah. So to make something explicit that maybe was implicit in my previous answer, Bovink and Kuyper were the progenitors of this term neo-Calvinism. So neo-Calvinism, again, to make it explicit, I got to say it every time, it's not new Calvinism. New Calvinism was an American evangelical movement. It's a recovery of reformed soteriology for American evangelicals about 15, 20 years ago, let's say. But neo-Calvinism is a 19th century theological movement from the Netherlands. It's not very international, but its roots are in the Netherlands in the thought of Kuiper and Bovink. And Abraham Kuyper was a theologian, prime minister of the Netherlands, and also the founder of the Free University of Amsterdam, uh, journalist, and and all all of the above. And he really, he was he was um, tireless in all of his efforts because he was trying to show, again, the ongoing relevance and the ongoing foundational role of Christianity for all of public life. And Bovink was all oftentimes considered, you know, um, under Kuyper's shadow. But now I think we're gonna we're beginning to see his his relevance and his um, importance a lot more. Kuiper and Bovink's role is kind of like the Luther and Calvin or Plato and Aristotle sort of archetypes, right? Where you got Plato, the more um, let's say more mythological, the more cosmic building, worldview building sort of figure. Aristotle, the more patient analyst. Um, you know, Bertrand Russell talks about how I think he he mentioned something about how. Aristotle is Plato diluted with common sense. Um, and Calvin was the patient, you know, commentator, uh, pastor. Luther was the occasional politician, sort of, well, not politician, but you know, he, was, he was writing so much um, occasional texts in response to political um, events and theological events and things like that. And so you have to kind of draw out all of Luther's thoughts from a lot of more piecemeal writings. But, but again, Calvin was a systematizer. In a similar fashion, Kuiper was that pol political figure writing more occasional texts. And Bobbing was the scholar, was the one who was really patiently drawing out all of the implications of Kuiper's thought, refining it, where Kuiper was perhaps more speculative, more precise, and more inductive was Bobbing. And so he wrote the Reform Dogmatics, which is the four-volume magnum opus, which I would consider the premier neo-Calvinist dogmatic text. And alongside that, he also wrote works on Christian worldview, Christianity and science, that again, drew out a lot of the implications of Kuiper's thought, but really refined it and honed it and made it more careful, made it more precise. And um, Bavink was therefore the theologian of the neo-Calvinist movement. And he's he drew out again what Kuiper started. So th these are the two figures that we're talking about primarily when we think about neo-Calvinism. There's lots of permutations of neo-Calvinism. There's second, third generation. You could talk about those developments in the Netherlands or in America or beyond, even in China and things like that. But but that's the route that we're trying to get back to. And a lot, a lot of times, those second and third generation figures focus primarily on culture, on horizontalized issues like philosophy and um, the arts and things like that. And so when we take a look at 21st century scholarship on neo-Calvinism, oftentimes you just have treatises on apologetics, philosophy, culture, but you really don't see much of the theological distinctives of neo-Calvinism. And we wanted to draw that out in this book. 
That's a very helpful uh, introduction to Kuiper and Bovink's relationship to neo-Calvinism. Uh, Dr. Sutanto, you mentioned previously just some of the differences between Calvinism and neo-Calvinism. And maybe if you wanted to spend a few more moments fleshing that out, uh, that would be helpful to our audience, as well as uh, some similarities between those two systems of thought. And uh, that should set the table for a, a more in-depth discussion on the theological distinctives here later on in our conversation. Yeah. So like I said before, in response to the first query, um, the, the neo in Calvinism is the the bringing together or bringing into dialogue the older Reformed confessional theology to the challenges of modernity, right? So um, if modernity is a holistic form of unbelief, modernism particularly, as a worldview is a holistic form of unbelief, where they're going to say, well, if God doesn't exist, then we have to rethink every area of life. So um, Bavink here has in view particularly Friedrich Nietzsche, who says that if God is dead, then we can't just live life um, as we did before. We have to really rethink about human existence, society, and so on, because all of that existence actually presupposed the old Christian foundation. So Bavink wrote Christian Worldview in 1904, and um, his dates were 1854, 1921 particularly. And he wrote Christian Worldview in 1904, and he started out, hit that book in the introduction with a quote to Nietzsche about the death of God and so on. And so we got to again reconsider if God does exist, then we have to show how that existence leavens our understanding of the three biggest areas of life, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics, the theory of being, theory of knowing, and theory of living. So that encounter of holistic unbelief and therefore that this, 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 seeing of a need to update the older Calvinism to show forth all of its horizontalized implications is one aspect of the neo part. So again, I'm presupposing that Calvinism just refers to the older reformed theology for, for our purposes at this point. The second thing is, is a more intensive definition of, of maybe the neo aspect of it, which is that they wanted to show how the modern ideals of, let's say, pluralism, of democracy, of even uh, the freedom of conscience that were really prized by the modernists actually have a better foundation in reform theology. So one of the things that Kuiper says is that one of the mistakes of you know Calvin's Geneva was that they did not allow Roman Catholics or Arminians to be uh, citizens of Geneva, for instance. They had a more theocratic understanding of the church-state relation, for instance. And so they recognize, Bobby and Kuiper did, that in the modern period, we have now this idea of democracy and the equality of all people and the freedom of conscience as something that they prioritized and something that they prized. And instead of just resisting that modern idea that I think we all take for granted now, uh, because it really sh shapes in large part not just European society, but also American society, um, that these ideals themselves, again, have their roots in the older Calvinist tradition. And Kuiper would argue, if, if Christ is Lord, that means that Christians are not Lord. If Christ is Lord, that means that no human being can be Lord over another. And so they really criticize the idea of a monarch. They really criticize the idea of a established church, where the church and the government are really intertwined together, where you have a Christian nation idea in an established sense of the term. And they wanted to say that actually, no, Christianity makes a better home for pluralization and pluralism. So they structured Dutch society in this way. When Kuiper was prime minister, he established this idea of sphere sovereignty or pluralization, where the government would actually um, be a, a resource and a, and a way of prioritizing and protecting the rights of different worldviews to coexist with one another. So even in the Dutch system today, you have public schools that are either Christian, Roman Catholic, Buddhist, Hindu, um, and these are all public schools. They are not private schools. Why did Kyber do that? Well, he wanted to communicate that secularism is not the public option, and then faith is a private option. He wanted to show that all of these worldviews are all equally public, and they're all vying for your public commitment, and that these are all claims to public knowledge, not just private piety. So... And we have another, you know, we have another editorial introduction coming out in our TNT Clark Handbook of Neo-Calvinism that we just submitted to the publishers probably about uh, two, three weeks ago. 
And there I try to talk about neo-Calvinism in terms of its extensive sense and then in terms of its intensive sense. The extensive sense is the way in which we have a theology that can ground every area of life, again, philosophy, art, so on, culture. But then in the intensive sense, we have this theology that engages with modernity in a very specific way. And therefore, the doctrines of common grace, image of God, sovereignty of God, are actually foundations for the things that modern people take for granted, like, again, democracy, pluralization, and God's patience with the unbeliever means, therefore, we have to coexist with the unbeliever. And so we persuade by means of the spirit and not by means of the sword, those sorts of topics. Um, so extensive and intensive, those are two ways. I know that's a long answer, but um, we can get into it more. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I imagine for this next question, this will probably take the bulk of our conversation. Um, the subtitle of this book is A Theological Introduction. And as one uh, skims through the table of contents, they'll see the various uh, doctrines that you're introducing um, in this neo-Calvinist lens. Um, so th this question is, can you just spend some time summarizing some of the theological distinctives of neo-Calvinism for our listeners, perhaps whet their appetite uh, for them right. to pick up this book and read it? It's a, uh, wow. So basically I have to summarize every chapter. No, um, uh, so yeah, in the book, we try to identify the very doctrines that Kuiper and Bobbing presented themselves as the doctrines to reconsider, to present afresh, to critically apply in the modern age, particularly. And again, they were motivated uh, to do this because they, they argued that we need to consider the whole of Revelation, the whole of the Bible afresh. Um, so they weren't just motivated apologetically. They were also motivated by the pressure of revelation, the pressure of Holy Scripture. And they, they argue that there were maybe some blind spots in the past that we have to address. And, we, and actually the whole of the Bible has different answers to that. So I don't want to give the impression to our listeners that, you know, they were just like, oh, they got this modern thing. So they got to respond to it. No, they, they really try to draw deeply from the font of the principle of the Bible, right? The principium of the Bible. They believed in, in the norming norm of Holy Scripture. And if you want to get more into this, we do have a podcast called Grace in Common with James Eglinton, Corey Brock, Marinus de Young, where we try to cover um, all of these aspects of neo-Calvinism and introduce it to our listeners. But but yeah, so when you take a look at Bobbing and Kuiper's corpus, they actually argued that these particular doctrines that we picked out were the ones that, that needed fresh articulation. And you can notice from our table of contents, there is no chapter on, let's say, the doctrine of God. Um, it doesn't mean that they don't have insights here and there about the doctrine of God that are very fresh and interesting and even critically innovative. But but in their perspective, they were mainly retrieving the old model of the doctrine of God. So we didn't have a chapter on that. But we did have a chapter on the doctrine of scripture, for instance. And one of the surprising things that we found when we were researching for this book, drawing from our doctoral work and so on, was that Kuiper and Bovink, um, and especially Kuiper said, it's the doctrine of scripture that we really reconsidered afresh. And same with Bavink. Um, he said that we have to present scripture in a more acute way, he says, in one particular text. So doctrine of scripture was really interesting. What they meant by that were, were at least two aspects. One, the idea of organic inspiration, which I think, again, as 21st century reform people, we take for granted because we learn about that stuff from Gerhardus Voss and B.B. Warfield. But I think they were really in, in, in conversation with people like Bavink and Kuiper. Um, so organic inspiration was very commonplace in the 20th, 21st centuries because of, I think, the roots of Bavink and Kuiper. And the idea here is that God inspires the human authors of scripture in a way that does not take away their agencies, but uses their psychologies, their personalities, their styles, their histories, their context to communicate exactly what God wants them to communicate so that we don't have to bypass, therefore, historical, grammatical, his, even historical textual considerations about the sources that these authors were using, and even their their psychological state of mind, right? These are not to be bypassed, but rather they give us an insight into the meaning of the text. So that's organic inspiration. And we can talk more about that if you want. The, the second aspect of Holy Scripture is the way in which, again, Scripture is not just a principia for, principium for theology, but also has a leavening influence. So uh, Scripture is not the only source for the other sciences, the other academic disciplines, but Scripture is still the authority and the norm for the other disciplines, right? We've got to make a strong distinction there. So scripture is not the scientific textbook for, say, the natural sciences or the historical sciences. 
but scripture remains a norm for those sciences. So how, how does that play out? What does that look like in practice? So they were really trying to, to write about that. So if you read Bobbing's Christianity and Science, which we just translated for Crossway, um, um, a companion to Bobbing's 1904 Christian worldview, that's really what Bobbing was really wrestling with. Um, what, what difference does Christian principles make for the other sciences in particular? So that's doctrine of scripture. Um, we also covered, for instance, the doctrine of the image of God and the way in which Kuiper and Bavink believe that the image of God does not just refer to the individual, but to corporate humanity as a whole, as a unity and diversity. Um, we also covered the idea of the Catholicity of the Christian church. So if, if Catholicity, um, as, as commonly held, refers to the unity of Christian doctrine, of Christian communion, from the past all the way to the present and the future. Um, Kuiper and Bavink also talked about Catholicity in terms of the universality of Christianity and engaging with unbelief, that even unbelievers will always echo something true from the Christian faith because they're made in the image of God. So Catholicity doesn't just have a synchronic aspect. It also has a diachronic and horizontal aspect to the present, not just between Christians and other Christians, but also the the inescapably of Christian inescapability sorry of Christianity for the unbeliever. Um, there's also the doctrine of general revelation. For them, general revelation has to be distinguished from natural theology. It doesn't mean that we we can't have a true natural theology. Christians can have a true natural theology, but general revelation is not reducible to um, common notions or propositions. General revelation refers specifically to the effect of the feeling of absolute dependence, which they draw from the romantic tradition, from figures like Schleiermacher. And so everybody feels that God exists, but nobody professes that God exists in a way that is comporting with that feeling because we try to suppress that feeling as best as we can because alongside the feeling of dependence is a feeling of judgment and so on. So there's a lot that we can say about that as well. And there's the doctrine of the church and the world. Um, and there's the doctrine as well of common grace, which is really significant for Bobbing and Kuiper. Um, common grace is this idea of God's patience, loving patience to the unbeliever and God gifting them with life-giving, epistemic, and moral truths despite their resistance to God. Um, and common grace, I think, is already resident in our reformers, resident even in people like Augustine, right? But conceptually, it's something that, that Bobby and Kyber really coined um, um, as a term, I mean. But So let me say that again. Conceptually, it's always been resident. But as a term, it's been emphasized more so by Kuiper and Bobbing. So even in Petrus van Maastricht, you have this idea of an inward grace for the unbeliever that gives them morality, that gives them access to public virtue and things like that. And, and so Bobby and Kuiper argues, well, when the unbeliever does something good, it's because God is gifting them with common grace. And you have the opportunity to contextualize and persuade them by appealing to what they know by general revelation and common grace, what they feel that is true in their heart, for instance. So that's a long survey. It's a brief survey, but it's still long. I feel like I'm meandering because basically get the book if you want to read more or you can listen to Grace and Common as well for in-depth looks on each of those. Yeah, I, for one, have been greatly benefited by the Grace and Common podcast. Uh, so Dr. Sitante, y'all are doing great work there. We're so thankful for all of the contributions that y'all are making to the uh, discussions about Kuiper and Bob Inc. And those are some authors that uh, many Reformed Baptists uh, hold near and dear to their hearts. And since most uh, of our listeners are Reformed Baptists or Calvinistic Baptists in nature, uh, what would be your sales pitch to Baptists to familiarize themselves with Neo-Calvinism, Abraham Kuiper, Herman Bob Inc., and just anything related to uh, those men or, or this subject more broadly? What would you say to somebody who may have never touched a book written by Bob Inc. or Kuiper and, and you're trying to sell them on why they need to add these men to their library? Yeah, at least two, two things. First is, I think if you're living in the 21st century, much of what you know of Reformed theology has been mediated by this tradition. So um, organic inspiration, even the term general revelation, right? These are terms that you're getting from Bobbing and Kuiper. Um, terms, you know, the presupposition that the church and state should be distinct, for instance. And yet at the same time, Christ is Lord over all of life. How to understand those things. These are understandings that you got from Bobbing and Kuiper. If you're learning about, you know, 
um, all the way from redemptive historical hermeneutics, people like Gerhardus Voss, and I would argue even Meredith Klein, they have their roots in Bavink and Kuiper, once again. Uh, Voss and Bavink were, <coughs> excuse me, constantly in, in conversation with one another. And Christ-centered preaching, therefore, I would consider is, 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 is rooted in this tradition as well. So that's one. I think, again, what we consider reform today as vanilla reform is not just a pure, you know, 16th, 17th century uh, sort of reform theology, but oftentimes has been mediated by the neo-Calvinist tradition. Um, the second thing I would say, so learn about that tradition, because you're actually standing on it without without knowing it. You know, I gave a lecture at RTS Orlando on the Lordship of Christ, and I drew from this, this neo-Calvinist tradition. And... Um, a lot of people were like, wait a minute, you're, you're actually communicating that much of, of what we took for granted is neo-Calvinist. Are you saying that there are like secret neo-Calvinists, like Karl Rahner was saying they're secret Christians or something, you know? Um, well, not so much that we're all secret neo-Calvinists, but we've just been formed by it without really knowing it as much. Um, you know, we, we take for granted ideas of common grace and things like that. Well, again, these are the primary sources for that. We want to really consider um, these primary sources. Second thing I would say is that as we have known these terms, but without knowing the primary sources, these terms have permutated into something quite alien to their original usage. So when people think about worldview now, or when people think about, you know, common grace now, or, you know, the Lordship of Christ, people usually think about Christian theonomy, reconstructionism. Um, they think about Rush Dooney. They think about some bad forms of Antillianism, right? Um, and when you consider what Boving and Kuiper were doing with these terms, they were very foreign to what these authors were oftentimes doing with these terms. So again, the Lordship of Jesus, for instance, in Kuiper, means actually an argument for democracy, which is very much the opposite of what people think it to mean today. People think, yo, you got to take over. You're sort of a post-millennial sort of theologian who is going to take over the coffee shop next door. And, and when you're doing that, you're advancing Christ's kingdom in the state of Virginia or something, right? No, you're, that's not what they mean by that. It means that Christ will come back and Christ is calling you to be patient now with the unbeliever. So how are you treating your neighbor? You know, are you treating your neighbor the way Christ is patient with your neighbor? I'm trying to persuade them, trying to, trying to be um, patient with their unbelief and so on. So that's, 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 that's a huge difference between how that's used today. Uh, I, I've lost count of how many times I've met people who only quote the every square inch uh, idea from Kuiper and completely take it out of context and completely just rip it apart and then really imbue a bunch of Rush Dunian uh, understanding into that term rather than what Kuiper himself would say. Even the idea of worldview. Oftentimes worldview is used as like a weapon. Like oh, I've got a Christian worldview. You don't. Ha, let me attack you, right? Um, worldview for Bavink particularly is a it's a corporate reality. It's a external reality that every Christian is going toward and no Christian fully has. That's a very different idea too. It's more like a map rather than spectacle. Scripture is your spectacles and everybody needs those spectacles to form that map. But the Christian worldview is a cosmic reality. It's more like a um, the the that theology that every Christian is trying to get toward rather than theology that you start with, that you begin with. Everybody comes with presupposition and assumptions, but we need to challenge those assumptions by way of the cosmic Christian worldview. And to know that Christian worldview, therefore, you need the labors of every Christian in every discipline across space and time. And so we're only on our way there. And it's an inductive idea, not a deductive idea. Now, that's a very different understanding as well than a lot of what people think about worldview. People think about worldview as you've attended a worldview seminar. You know now that God is the creator. We're made in the image of God. Christ saves us. Okay, good. That's our seed ideas. But you haven't really answered about, you know, what it means to, 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 to have this Christian worldview as informed by the global faith. You know, um, even the way in which the Christian worldview has a tra transforms our understanding of human language, of the disciplines of life, things like that. So there's just so many things we got to say about worldview that we can't possibly have as individuals, as localized people in a particular space and time. So that's my that's my pitch. Mm. Amen. Very helpful. Um, this is my final question for you as we begin to wrap up our conversation. Uh, you've mentioned some uh, resources that our listeners could yeah. get a hold of, including the project that would be forthcoming uh, the handbook on neo-Calvinism by TNT Clark. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned your podcast. Uh, 
Uh, so part A of this question, are there any other resources that you think our audience should familiarize their self with as they consider your book, Neo-Calvinism, and this subject? And then part B, do you have any final thoughts or final encouragements related to anything we've been discussing in this conversation? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, you know, we consider our work to be just a pathway toward the prime resources. If we can get more people to consider these prime resources afresh, then we would consider our work to be successful. So pick up Boving's Reform Dogmatics. You know, if you haven't, uh, if, if seminaries are not assigning that, I'm, I'm, I would want to know what they're assigning in place of that. Uh, there's no good reason to not assign it now that it's available to us. Um, I think we should be assigning a lot of the Reform Scholastics, but also be assigning a lot of Bovink and, and, and a lot of Kuiper, right? So um, in my class, for instance, I, I try to assign as much Tiritan and Bovink as possible. And I think we should be just drawing people into this older tradition. Um, not just the reform, but also the neo-Calvinists. So pick up Bob's reform dogmatics. If that's too daunting for you, if you're a lame lay person, you know, and you're, you're busy, pick up their wonderful works of God, his wonderful works of God, which is a distillation of the reform dogmatics. And if you're a younger person, if you're a student, Bobbing actually wrote for you as well in his guidebook for the instruction of the Christian religion, which just came out in 2022 with Hendrickson Publishers, which is an even more condensed version of the reform dogmatics. So reform dogmatics is kind of the four volume, you know, all you can eat, but um, the wonderful works of God is like, if you just want the main course, you know, here it is. And if you just want it, the, the protein of the main course, then you can get the guidebook for the instruction of the Christian religion and the guidebook and the wonderful works of God are actually the um, later uh, bobbing uh, writing. It's the, so it's, you actually get his more mature presentation. Reform dogmatics were actually most of it was written in the earlier part of his life, 1895, I think, to 1911, whereas Wonderful Works of God was 1909. And the guidebook was, I believe, 1915. So toward the end of Bobbing's career, he distilled it even further. And so you get the mature Bobbing even in the shorter works. Also pick up, you know, Christian worldview, Christianity and science. If you're thinking about how does Bobbing consider the theology that he has and the reform dogmatics and so on to be applied to metaphysics epistemology ethics natural sciences humanities then pick up pick up these volumes they're short but they're dense um so you know read them in the morning with a cup of coffee um they're really really good and i think they'll reshape your understanding of worldview from perhaps what you've you've heard about worldview in the past and from kuiper um i would say pick up his encyclopedia of christian religion um, people talk about the lectures of Calvinism, but I actually think the encyclopedia is much more useful and helpful because you get Kuiper, the dogmatician in that text way more. Um, and and we do admit that the neo-Calvinist introduction that we wrote is very Bovink heavy because I do think Bovink is improving on Kuiper in many respects. So I, I consider that a strength of the book that you focus uh, that we focus on Bovink's accents over Kuiper's, but Kuiper is still brilliant and we should consider much of what he says, especially in the encyclopedia. Um, yeah, pick up the TNC Clark handbook of, of, of neo-Calvinism. If you can't pick that up because it's expensive, you can wait for the paperback. It's going to come out in about a year and a half after the release date of the hardback. So maybe about late 2025, you might see that. But get your library to order the TNC Clark handbook of neo-Calvinism there. We consider not only the the doctrinal loci of neo-Calvinism, all the way from the doctrine of God to the last things. It's more comprehensive than what we offered even the, in the introduction because we have 40 authors in this handbook to cover a lot of this. We also cover the secondary generation, figures like Gerhardus Voss, G.C. Burkhauer, Klaus Schilder, uh, Hermann Doivier, each get a chapter, and we show how these figures all drew from Kuiper and Bobbing in both critical and constructive ways. We also show neo-Calvinism from a historical perspective, their dialogues with Roman Catholicism, their dialogue and, and the way in which they engage with the theology of Karl Barth, especially in the latter generations of neo-Calvinism. Uh, the development of neo-Calvinism in, in, in North America and in the Netherlands is covered in that section. Then we finally cover the legacy of neo-Calvinism, neo-Calvinism for the global world and world Christianity, Neo-Calvinism analytic philosophy, Neo-Calvinism and continental philosophy with Christopher Watkin writing that chapter, Nicholas Wolterstorff writing the chapter on analytic philosophy, and, and Tim Keller posthumously now, um, sadly, has a chapter on, on pastoral ministry and the way in which he drew from, from this thought for his own ministry in Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. So there's just so much there to consider.
Um, we do have more projects in the pipeline coming out. Look out for a couple of books from me on Bavink and anthropology. Um, and also look out for a Bavink reader that I'm editing for with uh, Gail Dornbos, that one of the Baker academic. That should be out, um, Lord willing, early 2026. Brother, this is making me uh, like a kid in a candy store. I cannot wait for these works to be published. I know there are so many listening right now who are licking their chops with excitement over the opportunity to continue to learn more about the neo-Calvinistic tradition, as well as the writings of men like Bob Inc. and Kuiper and others that you mentioned. Thank you so much for coming on the Covenant podcast today, Dr. Sutanto. It was a joy getting to know you, getting to meet you today. Uh, we wish you all the best in your labors with RTS and, and in your continued scholarship. So thank you so much for all that you do, sir. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And to our listeners, we do want to thank you again for your continued support of the Covenant podcast. And until next time, we wish you grace and peace. God bless.